We'll stick to the bare essentials, we'll answer three questions, and after that, the idea is that I want you guys to repeat answering those questions for yourself and see how that improves your, your learning of the content and your application of the content. Let's get to work. First question, why are polysaccharides needed? Now, um, there's two main things which is the difference. So in the previous video, we looked at monosaccharides and disaccharides. Well, if monosaccharides and disaccharides are doing such a good job, why do we need polysaccharides? Why invest the energy that it takes to, to put these monosaccharides and disaccharides together? Um, what, what added advantage is there to having these structures uh, called polysaccharides, okay? So um, the thing is, polysaccharides are great for storing monosaccharides, okay? So we know that monosaccharides are useful, such as glucose um, can, used, can be used to uh, release or store energy that can be released upon uh, carrying out respiration. So why don't we just store lots of glucose, right? So the point is though that glucose lowers the water potential. Every glucose, right, has to have lots of water molecules surrounding it. That means the more glucose we have in the cell, the more water the cell has to store, okay? And that can eventually lead to cells bursting. However, the thing about polysaccharides is, polysaccharides, right? So once I join lots of monosaccharides up and I make a polysaccharide, for example, something like this, this is polysaccharides, Polysacs are in, they are insoluble, okay? And because they are insoluble, they don't affect the water potential. Okay, so that means we can, we can then store lots more glucose, if it's glucose, we can store lots more glucose in the cell because it, that's not going to cause the cell to burst, okay? So the, the real importance about polysaccharides is they are a way to store lots of important monosaccharides in an insoluble form that doesn't affect water potential, okay? And then the cell can have lots of glucose available in the cell as, mu as much as is needed to keep the cell um, um, with enough energy, uh, with enough respiratory fuel to, to give the cell the energy that it needs to carry out its other processes, okay? Um, polysaccharides can also form strong structures, okay? So they can provide, they can be structural polysaccharides too, and, and we'll, we'll get to that point. But the key idea about polysaccharides is they're made of many monosaccharides joined up together with glycosidic bonds, and they form structures that are insoluble don't affect the water potential. Okay, now let's move on. Our second question is, how are the structures of polysaccharides related to their functions? So we've done the overview already. We know which three carb, carb, complex carbohydrates we're gonna hit. So let's just get straight into it. Let's go function first, okay? Because once we know the function, then we can start to uh, link appropriately. Then, we can, then the structure makes sense, okay? So what is the purpose of starch? Well, starch and glycogen, they have a shared function. They have a function that is similar, that is glucose, just put it this way, right? It is glucose. It is glucose storage, okay? That's the function of both starch and glycogen. Though remember, because starch is in plants, um, or glucose storage and release, well, okay. Glucose storage, and release. The release part's important because we're gonna, it, 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 it impacts or it affects uh, the kind of organism that can be supported. Okay, so let's look at starch. Um, starch has two parts to it, doesn't it, right? So starch has two structures, amylose, amylo, pectin. But they're both made of alpha glucose. Okay, alpha glucose, remember? Something like this. OH and the OH at carbon one is down. Okay, so alpha glucose. Just 
as a reminder, it's made of alpha glucose. Amylos, uh, well, amylos and the alpha glucose are joined in by one four alpha one to four glycosidic bonds. Okay, fine. And because of that, um, it causes the glucose molecules to be joined in a structure. The polysaccharide is coiled. Okay, so it forms a helical structure, which allows more compact storage um, of the glucose molecules. So you can fit more glucose molecules in a relatively um, small volume. Okay, so what what are the advantages of this structure? Well, it can store lots of glucose. It can store glucose, um, which means when we break those glycosidic bonds and release the glucose, glucose can be used for respiration. So that's good. Now, starch also has amylopectin. Now, amylopectin, in, in addition to being made similarly of alpha glucose and having the 1,4 glycosidic bonds, amylopectin forms a branched structure. So, yes, we kind of have the uh, 1 to 4 glycosidic bond sections, but at some point we also have a 1 to 6 right there. We've got a situation where we've got two glucose molecules joined to each other, right? But then this glucose molecule is also joined to another glucose molecules. Potentially now we've got a branch point and we can make two other long chains, okay? So um, what that means is structurally amylopectin is a branched polysaccharide and that means, it, in addition to the 1,4 glycosidic bonds, it also has um, alpha 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds. How does that affect its function? Well, because of the branches, right? Now, the branches are the points at which the glucose is released, right? The, the ends of the chain is where the glycosidic bonds are broken. To release glucose molecules to be used for respiration. But amylose has one long chain, so you can only remove one amylose at a time, but one glucose molecule at a time in amylose. Whereas with amylopectin, because you've got multiple branches, you've got multiple points at which you can, uh, multiple end points at which you can release the glucose, so the glucose can be released more quickly. Okay? So, glucose released more, glucose can be released more quickly, okay? All right, um, we'll now go on to glycogen, all right? Um, and we'll, we'll also make a note here that this is in plants, okay? And glycogen is in animals. Glycogen. It is made of alpha glucose. Okay, so it does have alpha one to four glycosidic bonds, but it's branched as well. So it also has alpha one to six glycosidic bonds as well. But in contrast to amylopectin, glycogen is very highly branched. Okay, there's, there's fewer residues between the branch points, okay? Um, so it's very highly branched, and what that means is the glucose can be released much more quickly because there are many more endpoints from, um, from which the glucose can be released by hydrolysis, okay? So very highly, it's very highly branched, and so the glucose can be released much more quickly. Okay, uh, glucose released even more quickly. Okay, or well, the rate of glucose release is even higher than in amylopectin. Make sure that you're very clear about what you're saying. Okay, if you if you call this very quick and that very quick it doesn't make the contrast. So make sure that you're making that contrast. Okay, and just let us remind ourselves that the reason why glycogen has to be 
releasing glucose even more quickly is because glycogen is the storage form in animals. So animals, you know, they're moving around, um, they have muscles, they have nervous system, they use more energy, they are homeostatic, they can, they can control the body temperature, which takes energy. All that energy needs ATP. ATP needs to be produced much more quickly. And so glucose needs to be released much more quickly in animals than it needs to be done in plants. That takes us to cellulose. Now, cellulose is not energy storage. Its function is very different. It is structural. It is a structural carbohydrate. It's not a storage carbohydrate. Um, and therefore, uh, its, its structure is going to be very different. Okay? Uh, first things first, it is made of beta glucose. So if we just quickly remind ourselves how a beta glucose could be different, it's got the same kind of the ring structure, and we still have a CH2OH there. Um, but in beta glucose, at carbon 1, that OH group is up there. What that means is um, when these beta glucose molecules are joined to each other, every other um, beta glucose is inverted. Oops. Every other beta glucose is inverted. So here I've got the CH2OH up there. Here we'll have the CH2OH down there. Right, we'll have the glycosidic bond up here. Right, and then here we'll have the CH2OH up there again. Okay, and so on and on up here. Yeah. So you see every other beta glucose is inverted or rotated by 180 degrees. What this means is the, the molecule that's formed is straight. Okay, this forms straight molecules and we should mention the bond here which is beta it's still one to four carbons being joined but it is beta one to four glycosidic all right and it produces straight molecules in contrast uh, to the other ones straight and unbranched straight and unbranched molecules long story short because these molecules are straight because they're unbranched, mole diff uh, different molecules of cellulose can come up very, very close to each other and line up with each other, close enough to form hydrogen bonds and cross-links between adjacent molecules. And what we get then is a very thick bundle of cellulose molecules forming a very strong structure made of many cellulose molecules that are lined up next to each other, each attracted to the next one by hydrogen bonding and cross-linking, okay, and which gives it its high tensile strength, okay? So that's structure related to function, and then we move on. Now, look, Remember, the point of this is not to explain every single thing. If I'm going through anything that's not making sense, you must go away and do that research, ask someone a question, get the help, okay? But once you've understood, this is how you need to make sure that these things are being stored in your mind effectively, and then you, are, you can prove to yourself that you can reproduce it, all right? Let's move on to our third question, which is what are the similarities and differences. Welcome to the world's most mashup Venn diagram. Okay, uh, here we have starch, glycogen, cellulose. This is how it's a good way to represent how, how we need to be thinking about this. This is potentially we could be asked to compare starch to glycogen, we could be asked to compare glycogen to cellulose, we could be asked to compare starch to cellulose, we might even be asked to compare between amylose and amylopectin and, and so on. Okay, but this is how we can work. So Anyway, the, in here we'll put the unique things, uh, where they overlap, we'll put the overlapping concepts, okay? So what, uh, let's begin, what do they all have in common? They all are made of glucose. They all are connected by glycosidic bonds, okay? 
and they are all insoluble. Okay. Now let's let's think about some of uh, the differences. Um, what what is the difference between starch and glycogen? Right. So what what is unique to starch? Uh, what is the difference between starch? Well, starch has unbranched amylose. That's its unique thing. Right. But the overlap between starch and glycogen is that the there is a branch. They both have a branched component to them, right? In terms of glycogen, the branching is high, right? So glycogen, you can say, very highly branched. Um, starch, you know, you, there is branching there, but um, you can say moderately branched. Yeah, uh, cellulose, Kind of unique, no branching whatsoever. No branching. Does cellulose have any overlap with glycogen? I mean, apart from that, nothing really. Um, cellulose and starch. I guess cellulose and starch have the plant thing in common that they both belong to plant, but functionally they are very different. Cellulose, well, again, starch and glycogen they have function in common. They have a storage function in common, right? But cellulose is unique. Its function is structural. Okay, um, cellulose also it is beta glucose, so it's the only one that has that, so it's made of beta glucose. It has beta 1 to 4 glycosidic bonds, starch and glycogen, they both have also alpha 1 to 4 and alpha 1 to 6 glycosidic bonds in common. Okay, you see how I'm doing this? Uh, is there anything that's shared between cellulose and glycogen? Nothing is really coming to mind apart from those things. Okay, but this is the point here. We're, we're trying to think of similarities and differences. We're trying to, we're trying to use this information. If you can do that, um, that's kind of moving yourself to a slightly higher level um, and that's ideally where you want to get to with repeated practice you will get there all right um, guys this has been our kind of short and sweet recap of polysaccharides remember this is me showing you some exercises which I would like you to do yourself all right this is not about sitting back and watching this stuff only that's that doesn't really help you a lot what you need to do is take away this exercise that I've given you and start doing the reps yourself. All right, guys? So let's get to work. I'm done here. This is where you get started. Good luck.